Good morning, Gasaholics. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas, the morning edition. Thanks for tuning in. You know, we drive down the road, and we take for granted the sound coming out of the speakers in our car. We take for granted we've got choices between, oh, satellite radio, AM, FM, cassettes. Cassettes? All right, not cassettes. CDs, and so forth. We take that for granted. But do you realize the automobile had been out over 20 years before someone decided to make a radio specifically for cars? All right, in the early 1900s, people had portable radios. These were quite intrusive, and they had to have their own separate battery, which was filled with acid. And that's how batteries worked back then. Good morning, Troy. How are you? <laughs> You're welcome for the uh, Irwindale tour the other night. But battery-powered radios were the only way to go, and they were big, and they were expensive. A battery-powered radio that was large enough, that had speakers and so forth that you could hear in a car, cost in about, well, today's dollars, about $1,800. Now, when you look at that back in the day, the cost of a radio was three times the cost of a Model T. And if you've ever seen a Model T, where the heck would you put the radio? Well, they came up with makeshift systems and mounted them on the frame, the batteries, under the floor. They mounted a radio head under the dashboard. But passenger lost all the leg space. But when did radios really come to fruition? Well, it was about 1929. The first car-specific radios were introduced. And it was an integral system in the car. Most had a radio head now, and then a tuner. Now, my car, my 48 Plymouth, had the radio head in the dashboard, and I posted a picture of that earlier today. But then it had a separate box underneath the dashboard. That separate box was connected to the radio with wires. The wire then went from the tuner, or the box, up to a speaker that was in the dashboard. One speaker. AM radio. That's it. Nothing more. That's all you got. FM radio really didn't come about until much later on. Now, in 1930, that's when they really started hitting the ground. And uh, like I said, the radios were expensive. Motorola offered the first specific to a car radio in 1930 for $130. And I told you about the $1,800 value in today's money. $130 back in 1930 was half the price of a new Model T in 1927. So think about that for a little bit. Model Ts were three to $400 brand new. The 1950s continued and AM radio was the dominant force. Now, there really wasn't FM radio out there, but... The AM radio was the most popular because of two things. FM radio didn't have much of a range. You had to be relatively close to the transmitters. You are better now, but you know as you drive down the freeways, you'll lose FM reception, whereas AM radio will go on for miles upon miles. I can remember uh, in my days on the road, I would travel from Dallas to Los Angeles on a regular basis by car. And when I hit El Paso, Texas, I could start picking up KFWB in Los Angeles. And I would pretty much listen to that the entire way back because the signal was pretty much uninterrupted as long as it wasn't a cloudy day. So the AM radio worked. Now, AM bro radio broadcasts were pretty much the only thing you could get back in the 1950s. And uh, they were strong. Now, Blah Punk, the German radio manufacturer started introducing AM, FM radios in 1952. But you were very limited on the stations you could listen to on FM, and they were mostly classical music and things of that nature. So it really took a couple of decades for FM radio to pick up in demand. And at that point, uh, you know, we were getting ready for things like 4-Track. Yeah, remember 4-Track? Now, these weren't radios. This was a player that hooked into your radio system and your speakers. Four-track. Then it went eight-track. 
And then after each track, it went to cassettes. But before even the four track, there were record players. That's right, automotive record players sitting on the floor of the car. But in the 1960s, car stereo, stereo, stereo was born. And the boss jocks came out. And things started to change as radios went from tube type, which took forever to warm up and work, to transistorized radios, which were on as soon as you turned the switch. So they started getting popular. Four track and eight track and cassettes, which came later, were add-on units for the most part, and you put them underneath your dashboard. In my van, I had one with a slide mount, so I could take it out. It was out of sight, out of mind. You didn't get your car broken into so someone could steal it, and that's what happened. But later on, the manufacturers started to incorporate eight tracks within the radio system in the car itself, and it was an in-dash unit made specifically for the car. They were good for the time. They were the only alternative, really. You had a couple of speakers by that point because now you had FM and stereo, stereo, stereo. So you needed that extra speaker to get all the benefits of that FM. Now, early stereos placed one channel on the front speaker and the other on the rear speaker. But the system that used the modern left and right format appeared soon after. A track format owes a lot to uh, car head units. It, if it wasn't for the car audio, the entire format probably wouldn't have worked, and Ford was one of the first ones to aggressively push the platform. Eventually, competing with OEMs picked up the four other competing audio, uh, OEMs picked up the format as well, and you could get a cassette player within the dashboard of your vehicle. But here in Southern California, we had Mad Man Munts. Yeah, Munts Auto Stereo Land. And it was right across the street from Galpin Ford back in the 60s. And I can remember it very well. I had my first accident right out in front of them looking at a custom car in the driveway. But that's another story altogether. Four tracks, eight tracks, then cassettes came about. In the 1980s, the compact disc didn't dislodge the cassette just yet because, well, they were a little more expensive, and we had the cassettes. They worked fine. I still have a cassette player in my 1989 Corvette, but um, I don't have any cassettes, so we don't listen to it. I do have an add-on CD player with the car, but I love hearing the sound of the exhaust on that car, and I have never put a CD in or a cassette. Now, Tory Glenn saying his cousin had a record player in his 59 Chevy. That's right, he played 45s and they were available right from the factory. It was an option from Chevrolet. The 1990s, the CD players became the dominant force. And even the radios you buy today, when you go to get one, it's going to have that CD player built in. Hi, Debbie. How are you doing this morning? Debbie Trunnell. Ah, uh, we go back a long ways. Drag racing with NDRA. Ah, uh, some good times. Our racer family is... It's quite extensive, and I love them, and I miss them all. All right, Bluetooth technology came about in the in these days, in the 2000s, and the Bluetooth allowed for many other things going on, including the addition of now your satellite radios. Now, satellite radio opened up a whole bunch of people to listen because you have many different types of shows and programming on satellite that you can pick up in your car. The issue with satellite, it's not free. Everything else is free, AM, FM. And you pay for the cassettes when you buy them, mm, not cassettes, CDs when you buy them, but you can use them until they wear out. Hi, Sandra Reynolds, good morning to you as well. But Bluetooth allows hands-free calling and all sorts of other things in the radios of a car. The stereo systems or audio systems in a car have gotten quite advanced over the years and the sound kind of rivals what you used to be able to get in your home right in the dashboard of your car and there are many other options that go along with this and we were at a car show a while back when we still had car shows you remember car shows don't you i remember car shows but about a year ago a little over a year ago randy cardoon from KNX 1070, talking about cars, and I were the hosts of the big Christmas extravaganza, and uh, we saw a guy bring, on, bring in a Tesla, and he was able to program the stereo system 
to make the car dance and flash its lights and do all sorts of other things while it played music. It opened and closed the doors and all sorts of fun stuff. So radio systems or stereo systems have really gotten advanced over the years. Hi, Christian. How are you this morning? Mike Cook, Corey Weaver. Uh, and that's some of what goes on. It, about 2010, the cassette started to wane. Yeah, really quickly. It went away real quick. And what's coming up now on car stereos is going to be amazing. First off, you're going to get heads-up display. You're going to be able to see the image of the person singing or their album cover or, or what have you on the windshield of your car. That won't be too distracting, now will it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, 2011 marked the first year that manufacturers stopped offering cassette decks. So they were still available through 2010. The last car to roll off this assembly line with an OEM, a factory-installed cassette player, was the 2010 Lexus SC430. Lexus was a little slow, weren't they? All right, the CD player is likely the next format that's going to be on the chopping block as several OEMs have stopped offering CD changers. After 2012, the CD started to lose it's popularity. Why? Well, you got to fiddle with it and you got to put them in. That's where the satellite technology has come into play. So think about that. Audio systems out of your car. Why did they have them? Entertainment while you drove. Now, my wife's got a great AM FM stereo in her 46 Ford. But the problem with the old cars that we have, like my Plymouth and her Ford, is they are not very aerodynamic. There is tons of wind noise. And when you're driving down the freeway, you really can't hear the radio. I don't even have one in my Plymouth anymore. I took it out decades ago. She's got one in her car. When we're driving slow, cruising, doing a, a soft cruise or slow cruise, radio is great. We can hear it. On the freeway, might as well shut it off. All right, stereos, radios. Audio systems in your car. Now, one thing that I, I kind of joke about, when I lived in New Jersey, New Jersey still had on the books a law against boisterous music coming from the horseless carriages. And what they did is they came up with this law. It wasn't for radios because they weren't really around yet and horseless carriages. Um, it was people singing as they rode down the street in their car, scaring the horses. So they came up with a law, no boisterous music coming from a horseless carriage, and that was still on the books in the 1970s. Hi, Jason, Jill. How are you doing there in Minnesota? We're doing great here in Southern California. Hope you're doing well, too. It's 2021. Hopefully, things are going to get better. This is Gas, your morning edition. Brought to you by Service Tech Service Equipment here in Simi Valley, California, with all your service equipment needs, and they'll help you when you need it. Talk to Craig Heidenthal there. Check him out on Facebook, Service Tech Tools and Equipment. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas, the morning edition, and I hope you got some music in your bones today. Have a great day. Take care now. And hey, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's free. Talking about cars. Two Tired Guys Productions, and Gas, the great American auto scene. Since 1990, your source for information, trivia, fun facts, and hopefully a little bit of humor. Take care, folks. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas.